The Tom Woods Show, episode 2213. Prepare to set fire to the index card of allowable opinion. Your daily dose of liberty education starts here. The Tom Woods Show. Come on now, folks. If you ain't going to start that side hustle now, then when? Check out my free ebook, Five Paths to an Online Income, where I take you step by step through five things that I do that keep food on the Woods household table and how you can do them too. Check it out at pathstoincome.com. Hey, everybody. Tom Woods here. All right. I'm just getting something off my chest today. I'm going through an article and I just need to respond to it. This is an article that David Gordon commented on very briefly on the Mises Institute's blog, and it was, I think, brought to his attention by Walter Block. It's an article in a journal called Theory, Culture, and Society, and it's written by a woman named Melinda Cooper, who is a professor at the Australian National University. She is in the School of Sociology, where her position is in the field of gender, sexuality, and culture. And the article in question has to do in large part with our hero, Murray Rothbard, of course, the brilliant polymath who gave birth to the modern libertarian movement. He took all the different ingredients and created something out of it that had not been there before. And the article I'm talking about is the alt-right. Of course, everything's the alt-right, isn't it? The alt-right, neoliberalism, libertarianism, and the fascist temptation. Well, where would we be? without the word fascist in the title. So you may say, Woods, why are you bothering to do this? I don't know. I think we need to be reminded once in a while that there are people on the public dole whose job it is to misunderstand what other people are saying. And of course, notice how charitable I'm being, that this is an innocent misunderstanding rather than an outright attack. But all the same, let's take a look at it. First of all, the very word neoliberalism, I did an episode on this a long time ago. Right away, you know you're not dealing with a serious person. Almost nobody calls himself a neoliberal. So you're, in effect, shooting at a phantom. Nobody says, I'm a neoliberal. So then why are you using the term if nobody uses it as an identifier? Some people call themselves libertarians, conservatives, different kinds of conservatives, different kinds of liberals. But almost nobody says, I'm a neoliberal. Why don't you just say liberal? I don't understand. What is the neo? What is the purpose of the neo here? If they believe in classically liberal ideas, and not, obviously we're not talking about Hillary Clinton here, but the classical liberalism of private property, commerce, peace, freedom of speech, that sort of thing, then just say liberal. What is the point of the neo other than to make it sound sinister because it's a neologism and those always sound sinister. And it's a word you've never heard before and it's got neo at the front. Ooh, I don't know why you don't just say liberalism. So it's a, first of all, that's a dumb word. Nobody calls himself a neoliberal. So use the terms that people use to refer to themselves. You know, progressives call themselves progressives. So I call them progressives just for the sake of clarity. I don't make up some weirdo word. Anyway, so don't use the stupid word neoliberalism. It refers to nothing. Now, as for Rothbard, most people listening to this will be familiar with Murray Rothbard. He was extremely prolific and important as not just a libertarian scholar, but as a scholar, period. He was a great historian and also a great economic historian in particular. So his work on the Great Depression in his book, America's Great Depression, is extremely important. His book, The Panic of 1819, the, gosh, who, who was it who wrote Liberty and Power? Harry, I can't remember, but uh, I was reading a completely mainstream treatment of the Jacksonian era. And in the bibliographical essay, the author just said Murray Rothbard's book, The Panic of 1819, is unlikely to be superseded. He was the author of a multi-volume history of economic thought, of an extremely important economic treatise that more or less kept the Austrian school alive, namely Man, Economy, and State. And we could go on and on and on. He was editor of academic journals. He kept up an enormous correspondence with people, author of a couple of dozen books, thousands of articles, extraordinarily prolific and knowledgeable in multiple fields, hence a polymath. Now, there have been a lot of critics of Rothbard and no one's going to say that Rothbard is above criticism. Maybe he was wrong on some things. And so we'll talk about that and work to make his body of work even better. But Rothbard developed a system in defense of liberty. And he began with the idea of self-ownership 
or as Stefan Kinsella puts it, body ownership. There's nobody has a greater claim on your physical body and what happens to it than you yourself. And building upon that, he developed an entire edifice philosophically and then in economics, beginning with the action axiom, he builds out a system that leaves nothing out. There were parts of the work of Ludwig von Mises where Mises simply assumed everybody knew X, Y, or Z. Rothbard makes no such assumption. And in Man, Economy, and State, he fills in some of the gaps in Mises' work, particularly the extended treatment of production theory. But it all begins with axioms and deduction. There are no superfluous assumptions built into the system. He doesn't say, well, let's assume that everybody is greedy, or let's assume everybody is selfish, or let's assume everybody acts in pursuit of economic efficiency all the time. These are ideas that people who don't bother to read what we say assume we think, but none of this has anything to do with what we believe or our economics or anything. So we have this article then that is trying to cast Rothbard in, in a bad light. And, and when I, I look at it, the very beginning warns us of, quote, libertarianism's intrinsic contradictions. Again, when I see that, I think, all right, not a serious person. What are the contradictions involved in saying nobody should initiate violence against anybody else? What possible contradiction could there be in there? By the way, I will link to this article at tomwoods.com slash 2213, but I should warn you that it's now behind a paywall. When David Gordon briefly acknowledged it, and he didn't do a thorough smash or anything, he just pointed out a few of the errors, it was in the public domain, as far as I can say, or at the very least, you could click and read the article. And then suddenly, you have to pay $37.50 to read the article. And I rather suspect it's because David Gordon embarrassed the author. I don't see what other explanation there is. I suppose there could be an innocent explanation. But all the same, if you want to read this thing, you're going to have to pay. And so you're going to have to be really, really committed to this to to want to pay to read this. So I'm instead going to give you a summary of some of the problematic issues in the article. Now we read this toward the beginning. A trained mathematician, Rothbard was nevertheless convinced by his mentor, namely Ludwig von Mises, that mathematical models and statistical evidence were irrelevant to economic reasoning and developed instead an intricate, almost scholastic philosophy of market exchange that derived economic freedom and property rights from Lockean natural law. So she's totally confused. Lockean natural law has nothing to do with Rothbard's economic theory. It might have to do with his political philosophy, but it has nothing whatsoever to do with Rothbard's approach to market exchange, as she puts it, or his approach to deducing economic theory rather than trying to vindicate economic theory by the collection of data. You can't derive theory, economic theory, from the collection of data because you need theory to evaluate the data. So the theory has to come first. And the theory comes from deduction. That's Rothbard's point, and none of that has anything to do with Locke and natural law. Then we get this. From his Austrian mentors, Ludwig van Mises, I'm sure she meant to say von, and Karl Menger, Rothbard inherited the idea that the subjective determination of value, a key insight of the marginal counter-revolution to which Menger contributed, must be counterbalanced by some perfectly stable money token. This Rothbard locates in the commodity money of precious metals. So that's wrong. Where has Rothbard ever said the subjective determination of value needs to be counterbalanced by a, quote, perfectly stable money token? I think she's trying to sound smart. She doesn't know economics. So she's using these words. But Rothbard has never said that we need a, quote, perfectly stable money in order for the economy to work. And then she says, as long as it circulates outside of state control, Rothbard seems to suggest commodity money can't help but express the underlying value of economic relations. And can there, oh gosh, this is just, what does that mean? I'm not even going to finish that sentence. Rothbard specifically and repeatedly says how opposed he and the Austrians are to any program of, quote, the stabilization of money, because that would involve some kind of intervention and manipulation of money to make it, quote, unquote, stable. No, the money unit is probably going to gain value over time. We have no desire to counteract this, to create a, quote, perfectly stable money token. 
This is an entirely salutary feature of a market economy that the money unit tends to increase in value over time. There's no desire to make it, quote, stable. In fact, Rothbard specifically says it was the Irving Fisher people in the 1920s whose desire for a, quote, stable money brought about the instability of the 1920s because prices were, in fact, in the process of falling. And so the thought was, well, let's increase the money supply to offset this. But the increasing of the money supply through credit markets leads to the Austrian business cycle. So Rothbard was against all this. And he said this again and again. He has no desire to carry out some top-down effort to create a, quote, stable money token. No, you let the market make the money what it is through ordinary exchanges. Then after evaluating Rothbard's moves through you know, different political alliances and noting that when he chronicled the years, the 1940s and 50s later on, he pointed out that there were still the remnants of what he called an old right, a non-interventionist right that was non-interventionist both domestically and internationally. And he felt like they were really upholding the views that he championed and that libertarianism ought to champion. Whereas the official conservative movement, as reflected, for example, in particular in the magazine National Review, was turning into a hyper-interventionist movement that he could not support. And she says, having consigned himself to the extreme political margins, quite unlike herself, right? Rothbard developed a starkly dichotomous theory of power that saw the state as the instigator of all violence. Imagine how superficial you'd have to read Rothbard to think that he or anyone else would say that the state is the instigator of all violence. All violence? So without a state, there'd be no violence whatsoever? So every ordinary bank robbery was instigated by the state? Every ordinary stick-up at a convenience store was instigated by the state? Rothbard never says the state is the instigator of all violence. What he says is that the state has a monopoly on the initiation of violence, that that is what it's understood to be. That doesn't mean that it is the instigator of all violence, but that people are trained to believe that the violence initiated by the state is morally legitimate. Not that it's the only possible kind of violence. Why would you think that? And then I love this. Remember back when the left used to say, question authority? Well, of course, Melinda Cooper doesn't question authority. Here's what she says. His paranoia is extreme when it comes to central banking. Isn't it great when you hear progressives defending central banking? The central banks are just trying to help us, in our opinion. These are the progressives. Right? They're going to they're gonna criticize our institutions on behalf of uh, the common man, sure. So she says, his paranoia is extreme when it comes to central banking, an institution he is convinced that was created with the sole aim of inflating the money supply and defrauding producers and savers of their hard-earned wealth. Well, I wouldn't say the sole aim. Rothbard's view was that in addition to that, it was also, although this is, I suppose, a, another form of inflation, it was intended to protect the banks and the banking system against the kinds of things that might get them in trouble if there weren't a central bank to bail them out. So indeed, bailouts would be an example of the kind of thing that Rothbard doesn't want a central bank doing. Of course, he doesn't want the central bank existing at all, but this is one of the reasons he opposes it. So it's not just inflation per se, and that inflation redistributes wealth, but it's that the entire Federal Reserve cartel is meant to bolster the banking system, which is behaving in ways that no other industry could behave in, because it, they would all get in trouble if they did. Well, they don't get in trouble because there's a Federal Reserve standing ready to bail them out. This interests Melinda Cooper not at all, not at all, because only cranks are against central banks, and she's certainly not one of those, you see. So it has to be just Rothbard's paranoia. In his voluminous writings on money and banking, she says, Rothbard imbues the Federal Reserve with all the malign powers of action at a distance that far-right conspiracy theorists more often ascribe to international financiers and the Jews. So of course, we have to raise that. Even though Rothbard says nothing about this, we have to raise that. And then she quotes him as saying that something to the effect that if the general public really understood how the Fed operated, and then now this is a quotation from Rothbard, it would soon discover that the Fed, far from being the solution to the problem of inflation, is itself the heart and cause of the problem. Okay, well, that's certainly correct, and she quotes him as saying that. 
And then she says this, again, this is this progressive on behalf of the people who's going to question existing institutions. She says, the accusation strains credulity given that central banks have spent the last half century attempting to suppress inflation. <laughs> so, so in other words, I mean, I read their press release and it says they're attempting to suppress inflation. I don't know why Rothbard doesn't understand this. Well, you know, sometimes actions speak louder than words. You know, maybe there's something more to what they're doing than just what they say in the press release, number one. Number two, the past half century. First of all, that's interesting that she says past half century. So that leaves out the inflation of the late 60s into the early 70s that helped to lead to that inflation. She's, I guess, neglecting inflation later in the 70s. But interesting that she has to leave that part out. But of course, if you look at money supply trends since then, these are not institutions that are, quote unquote, fighting inflation. Prices should have been falling all this time, given increases in productivity, the way prices had fallen for hundreds of years before this. Prices should have been falling. So even if prices had held stable, which they didn't, and this is why your money today is worth much less than that same nominal amount in 1980. If the Federal Reserve had and central banks had been fighting inflation, then your money would be worth exactly the same amount, but it's not. Anyway, we can even leave all this analysis aside. Her idea that central banks were spending their time trying to fight inflation, well, this is a problem that didn't really exist before we had central banks. That every once in a while, you know, maybe there would be some massive discovery, but this is centuries and centuries ago, massive discovery of precious metals that would affect prices. But by and large, the mining of precious metals is a time-consuming and laborious process that occurs very, very slowly, whereas the production of other goods generally outpaces it. And so prices were generally falling. So what doesn't occur to her, why are these central banks fighting so hard against this problem when if she bothered to look, she'd notice there was no such problem before we had central banks, quote unquote, fighting that problem? Maybe they're causing the problem. Maybe it isn't Rothbard's paranoia, but just his rational analysis of the situation, that when you have an institution that has no physical constraint on its ability to multiply the amount of money, this is going to tend to push prices up because there's more money going around with the same amount of goods. Well, you're going to have, or outpacing in this case, the production of goods, you're going to have prices go up. So in fact, to the contrary, you could listen to just recent Fed chairman, they would say they would have an inflation target, like they want 2% inflation a year. So that's not people fighting inflation. In fact, they say the worst possible outcome is if we had the opposite of inflation, if we had falling prices, that's the worst possible outcome. And we have to fight against that by making sure we have at least a modest amount of price inflation per year. That is not what an institution fighting inflation says. But she has no interest in this because what's not fashionable to investigate this question so she's not going to do it. And then she says, having established the essential criminality of its methods, Rothbard will settle for nothing less than total insurrection against the state. What are you talking about? Nothing less? But he himself did less than total insurrection. I don't think Rothbard ever took up arms. I'm pretty sure he didn't. So apparently he did settle for less, a lot less than, quote, total insurrection against the state. Intellectually, he felt like, you should be completely against the state, that you shouldn't have some mental reservation that says, well, we need the state for X or Y. But he wasn't saying that it makes a whole lot of sense for us now to take up arms and overthrow the thing. Good luck with that. If you can find the example of Rothbard advocating that we do that anywhere, I'd love to see it. So there's no footnote here, of course. How could there be? Because Rothbard never said that. Then she says, Rothbard's relationship with his new left allies reached a breaking point in the early 1970s when he tried to convince them that inequality was not only natural but ethical because it reflected the biological variation in individuals' ability to produce wealth. Now, anytime you hear to produce wealth, you can assume the person doesn't understand Rothbard. Of course, he wants to produce wealth, but he's not single-mindedly preoccupied with the efficient production of wealth. This isn't the way his brain works. This isn't the way his system works. And his problem with the new left, you can read in his in fact, memoir, The Betrayal of the American Right, I wrote the introduction for it. And he says that they, they just went off the rails. They were becoming just outright Maoist, that the meetings they would have were like these interminable struggle sessions, 
And he just couldn't support that. It wasn't that he was going around trying to lecture them on the problems with egalitarianism. And his point was not, if we don't have egalitarianism, then people won't be able to produce the amount of wealth that they could otherwise produce. His point in writing his essays about egalitarianism was simply to show that there are natural inequalities that exist in the world, and they exist among human beings. And these are things ranging from, you know, somebody asked me the other day, do you think you could learn to be a great chess player? And yes, some people can, sort of. But the thing is, you can study and study and study, but if you don't have a natural, I personally think, a natural inclination, or let's say a pre-existing ability to become a great chess player, you can read all the books in the world. And if your brain doesn't work that way, then it doesn't work that way. The great chess player is not doing everything from scratch in his head every time. The great chess player is looking at that board and recognizing patterns. The great chess player is using a different part of his brain from the novice chess player. And it seems to me that there are people, some people have brains that are more cut out to do that than others. You know, I mean, I've studied chess quite a bit and I'm still just a strong amateur. And yet there are other people with the same amount of training that I've had who could become grandmasters. So, you know, there's nothing we can do about that. There's no law that can change that. But more than that, there's no moral reason that somebody whose brain does allow him to be a great chess player, that that person's wealth, such as it is, that he earns in chess competitions should be redistributed to me because I lack his chess abilities. Yes, in a certain sense, this person may not, you know, let's say, deserve his chess talent. But the point is, I don't deserve it either. Who says I deserve it? And certainly, why would we just automatically assume the state deserves the proceeds of his winnings? Where do we get that? That has nothing to do with anything. So that was Rothbard's point, is that we all have different abilities in a whole bunch of different areas. Just leave people alone. Okay, the only way to make everybody have the same outcome would be to violate their liberty in some outrageous way. If you let people act according to their abilities, they're going to have unequal outcomes because they have unequal abilities. But there's no moral problem with this. And there'd be a vastly greater moral problem in using violence to somehow try to correct it. That was what he was saying. He wasn't saying to the new left, hey, you know, if you people continue with your views on equality, why we won't create as much wealth as we would otherwise. I mean, I'm sure he does sort of believe that, but that utilitarian argument is not, it's just, that's not the way Rothbard thinks. Before I go on, let me say a quick thing that will help a lot of you and you know who you are. If you are in business and you're getting buried by your competition online, then build your brand, your reputation, and your lead flow with digital marketing by Persist SEO, our great sponsor. If you're a small local business, you're trying to compete against large companies in the service industry, increase your visibility with Persist SEO. Or if you have low or no leads coming in on a consistent basis, well, website search engine and conversion optimization can help move the needle to a more prosperous business model for you. If you're tired of cold calling, use your website as a lead generation engine. If you're not showing up for your services on the search engines, then get found with Persist SEO's expert search engine optimization. All you have to do is call 770-580-3736 or visit them at ineedseo.help for a free website audit and consultation. That's 770-580-3736 or ineedseo.help. Then we get this bombshell here. Indeed, Rothbard's thought process seems to lead to the logical conclusion that productive citizens should take up arms, not only against the state, but also against the many parasites who feed off its largesse, the non-producers and the welfare recipients. So she's saying that Rothbard's theory more or less demands that we go out into the street and mow down welfare recipients. Now, of course, Rothbard never said this and thought never occurred to him but that's what she says. But she admits Rothbard does stop short of translating his indictment of the welfare state into a call for white supremacist terrorism. Well, you don't say. How about that? And incidentally, white supremacist, that's another term that as soon as you hear somebody utter it, you can just dismiss that person. A white supremacist traditionally meant somebody who favored having the law reflect and enforce a superior position being assigned to the white race. That was what everybody meant when they talked about white supremacists during the civil rights movement. I don't know anyone who holds that position today. So white supremacist now means that you don't believe the typical BS that you're told, or you don't believe critical race theory or the 1619 project, or you don't think that the 
explanation for why different racial groups have different outcomes in terms of careers or income or whatever is due entirely to discrimination. That's white supremacism. Now, Thomas Sowell explained why those outcomes are not due to discrimination in numerous books of his. And he explains this in excruciating detail. So, for example, people will say, look, black PhDs earn less than white PhDs. That goes to show there must be discrimination. Okay, well, then you look more closely and you realize, well, you have to disaggregate these PhDs. More than half of black PhDs are EDDs. They're education doctorates, which are, those programs are notoriously undemanding. And the careers you get with them are unremunerative compared to careers that people tend to get with other PhDs. So when you disaggregate the data, you realize you're comparing apples and oranges. But it would be white supremacy to point this out these days because you're just supposed to say, well, look at this blob of data and it seems to confirm the systematic racism thesis, which you're supposed to accept without question. I don't accept that without question. But in this day and age, even opposing affirmative action would make you a white supremacist. So using that term shows you're an idiot. I mean, you just, you can't, I refuse to discuss things with people who use the term white supremacist, which means there is a vocal minority of the libertarian movement that uses the term white supremacist to refer to people like me. So I'm, I'm not talking to you because you're so dumb that you fall for the regime's stupid language. And this term does not refer to anything anymore. There is nobody who is saying we should go back to having a two-tiered society where there are facilities that aren't as good for one group. Nobody's advocating that. So you should not use that term. Then we get a discussion of Rothbard's alliance with the so-called paleoconservatives, that is the conservatives who, after the Cold War, did not want to continue the military-industrial complex, you know, want to let it continue along its merry way, but they wanted to start dismantling that and a lot of other things. So they, the paleocons did not want to staff the federal agencies the way the neocons did, just get their own people in there. They wanted to dismantle these agencies. So they were highly anti-state. And so we have Melinda Cooper saying that the paleocons were spurred to, quote, grand insurrectionist fantasies against the overbearing power of the state. I know these people very, very well. I have never heard a single one of them have an insurrectionist fantasy. No, I'm not one, not one, not ever. And then she says, in this respect alone, they can be counted as a uniquely American expression of fascism. So get this, they're extremely anti-state and that makes them fascists. Now, to me, the best expression of fascism came in that memorable line from Mussolini, everything in the state, nothing outside the state, nothing against the state. Well, she's in effect saying that the paleocons seem to believe something like the opposite of this, and this also makes them fascist. So there, you can't win, okay? If you, if you do favor vigorous state power, that makes you a fascist. And if you want to overthrow state power, well, guess what that makes you? Guess what that makes you? So let's just continue along here. She says that she's finally going to disclose to us the logical inconsistencies, the contradictions of libertarianism, and that the paleocons were going to help the libertarians resolve these contradictions. So she says this, libertarians had painted themselves into a corner by refusing all forms of coercion, private as well as public, and deluded themselves when they argued that a free market order could be sustained by purely voluntary contractual relations. She says, as long as it implied the protection of private property, a free market order needed some recognition of law and some institution capable of administering violence, a point that libertarians implicitly conceded when they turned to the solution of private law courts. Well, not implicitly. Libertarians had always said this. So she's looking for contradictions that aren't there. So Rothbard had never said that there would never be the need to use force. You would need to coerce a burglar. He never said that this was a contradiction for libertarianism. He simply said that you don't need a monopolistic agency to carry this out. But he never said this. He never said that, or it was never like a concession. Well, I, I'm implicitly conceding that I'm wrong because I'm saying we need to have courts. He was saying we don't need to have monopoly courts, but of course we need to have courts because on a free market as on anywhere else, there will be disputes that need to be resolved. Then we read, paleoconservatives offered libertarians a way out of this conundrum, this is a non-existent conundrum, by acknowledging the fact that freedom from the state implied radical unfreedom 
in the social or private sphere where rigorous gender and race hierarchies must hold sway. And then she quotes Lou Rockwell as saying this, which is something Lou had always said. This was not some concession that he made because of the internal contradictions of libertarianism. Lou said, and Lou is the founder of the Mises Institute, conservatives have always argued that political freedom is a necessary but not sufficient condition for the good society, and they're right. Neither is it sufficient for the free society. We also need social institutions and standards that encourage private virtue and protect the individual from the state. And he says that libertarians, if they make this mistake, are, quote, wrong to blur the distinction between state authority and social authority, as John Stuart Mill did. For a free society is buttressed by social authority. Every business requires a hierarchy of command, and every employer has the right to expect obedience within his proper sphere of authority. It is not different within the family, the church, the classroom. There's no problem with this. Libertarianism has always acknowledged this, with the exception of the very confused, weird John Stuart Mill, that there's nothing unlibertarian about society frowning upon certain things people might do. There's nothing wrong with that. That's purely voluntary. People can do that. People can say it's highly undesirable to have children out of wedlock because there's a huge pile of social science literature attesting to it that this will put them at a grave disadvantage and make them much, much more likely to suffer from all kinds of dysfunction. There's nothing wrong with that. And a libertarian would not say, hey, society, don't discourage people from doing that. They can do whatever they want. Of course they can do whatever they want. But there is nothing unlibertarian about discouraging people from acting in certain ways. I mean, left libertarians discourage people from acting in certain ways all the time. They're constantly discouraging me from having such and such guest on my podcast or holding such and such opinion. They constantly do it, and they don't reproach themselves for it. And nor should they, because there's nothing unlibertarian about that. There's nothing unlibertarian about there being authority relations within a church or within a chess club or whatever. Because these are voluntary institutions that people join voluntarily. And if they don't like them, they can withdraw from them. Robert Nisbet, in his very important book, The Quest for Community, shows the important role that institutions between the individual and the state play in being a counterbalance to the state and keeping a healthy and functioning society going and preventing it from being completely swallowed up by the state. So this is not any contradiction that libertarians needed any help overcoming. Not a contradiction. Because libertarians are opposed to the use of violence to uphold whatever norm it is. But there's no problem with socially enforced norms that are enforced just through disapproval, whatever else. There's nothing wrong with this. Or having your own community where you have your own rules and everybody knows the rules when they move there. Nothing wrong with that because that is perfectly in line with libertarian ideas. So anyway, if you want to torture yourself, you can certainly do that by reading this article and paying for it. I'll have a link at tomwoods.com slash 2213. Uh, if you like and appreciate what goes on here on the old Tom Woods show, by the way, I always appreciate people who support me in this endeavor. I mean, 2,200 episodes ain't nothing to shake a stick at. So I try to give back to people who support me. And as you'll see at supportinglisteners.com, there's a ton of stuff that I give to folks, not least of which is membership inside the Tom Woods Show Elite, which is my censorship-free discussion group where we have a wonderful, smart, congenial people. You'll want to be a member of that. But I have transcripts of all the interviews I do. I have courses. I have tons of goodies. I'll even help you with your writing. I'll help you do all kinds of things depending on what level you join at. I have all kinds of benefits for people who support me. So check it out at supportinglisteners.com. Put your money where your ears are, and I'll see you tomorrow. Become a smarter libertarian in just 30 minutes a day. Visit tomwoods.com to subscribe to the show for free, and we'll see you next time. Like the sound of The Tom Woods Show? My audio production is provided by Podsworth Media. Check them out at podsworth.com.